family. This is our call to worship for Sunday, March 22nd, and it's taken from a guide to prayer for all who seek God in the upper room. And this particular one is from Faith for Justice by Carlos G. Valles. We have an inborn persisting tendency to attribute to ourselves the successes of our spiritual life the resistance we offer to temptation, the devotion we achieve, the discipline we keep, and the good works we do. Surely we thank God for all that, but in our heart of hearts, we congratulate ourselves on our exploits and secretly worship our sword and our bow. We take as done by us what is done by God in us, even obvious graces from heaven 
stick to the soul and seem after some time to be connatural to us and springing from us. That is spiritual pride of the worst kind. And if it really takes hold of a soul, it is enough to stop any spiritual progress at all. This disease is very dangerous and is as dangerous as it is common. Some food for thought. God bless. Worshiping God with our tithes and offerings today, let me offer up Psalm 23 for the fourth Sunday in Lent. Good and faithful God, please pray with me. We bring our tithes and offerings to you this morning as part of our act of praise. The psalmist reminds us that you have filled our cup to overflowing and we are convicted by the image that perhaps we have only offered to you what spills out of our full cup. In your grace and love, let us see it instead that your love and blessing will not be contained in any vessel, but will always overflow to reach and bless others. May we not only see it this way, but may we live it in lives of generosity. In the name of Christ, who gave all and held nothing back. Amen. Well, good afternoon. This is Pastor Brian coming to you from the back porch of the parsonage. Thankful to sort of communicate with you this way. We'll call it a Bible study-ish sermon. But hear me say too, I'm so sorry that our world is living in fear and uh, we're having to be isolated and shut up and guarded but I also think that if we took sin just as serious if we could see the lostness in our society and in our neighbors and in our family members we would uh, maybe see a sense of urgency misplaced perhaps anyway we're we're doing as we're told we're being safe so thank you for joining us for worship in this capacity let us pray Lord God, we thank you for the opportunity to connect virtually. Uh, your spirit is powerful. It can go through radio waves, television waves, and certainly uh, through the computers. So bind us together this way, O oh Lord. Help us to learn from you, uh, regardless of what our circumstances uh, deem or come. Whatever comes our way, Lord, to know that you're our God and our faith is in you. So come Holy Spirit, inhabit your people, Open our ears, our hearts, and our minds, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've been looking at the last 24 hours of Jesus' life, and particularly we've gone from the Last Supper where Jesus instituted uh, the sacrament of communion with the disciples. Then uh, he was praying in the garden. You'll remember the arrest, and they would take Jesus uh, from the Mount of Olives, cross the Kidron Valley, up near the Temple Mount to Caiaphas' house, where he was placed in the dungeon, arrested, placed in the dungeon, and waiting trial, which we mentioned a lot last week was an illegal trial, uh, and he was condemned. Jesus was condemned, uh, but also we need to know that it was condemned by the righteous, and we talked about that last week, uh, his trial before Caiaphas. Uh, he was supposed to reach for love instead of fear, and we need to be emboldened to speak up to know what's right. Today, Jesus uh, comes in conflict with a couple more characters, one in particularly, Pilate, Pontius Pilate. You remember that name from the Apostles' Creed. Also, 
I mean, so to say that, to say he's an important figure, he's perhaps one of the figures that's most shrouded in mystery and understanding when it comes to Jesus' last days. Uh, certainly important just as a historical figure as well. So, in describing Jesus' life and creed, it reads, Born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate. Remember that? So the gospel, the gospel writer, writers call him governor of Judea. His actual title was prefect. In the Roman system, prefects were men who came from the Roman guard and were assigned to small territories that needed uh, observ observing. Pilate was the fifth prefect of Judea, and by the time we meet him in the scriptures, he had ruled for seven years. Generally, Pilate could be found in the city of Caesarea along the Mediterranean coast, but whenever the Jews had a large gathering in Jerusalem, he would travel there to make sure things stayed under control. Now, Pilate didn't have the best reputation in the Roman world. He was known for being inflexible, stubborn, uh, maybe a little harsh, heavy-handed, especially when it dealt with uh, religious things, with the Jews. These, so problems could lead to punishment, could lead to brutality, could lead to death. And in dealing with uh, these problems, his punishment tended to be brutal. And one of the few years after his encounter with Jesus, Pilate was stripped of his command, actually because of his cruelty in dealing with a group of Samaritans that he thought were staging a rebellion. So he was in Jerusalem. He stayed at the Praetorium, or the Antonio Fortress, uh, the northeast edge of the city. And some of our team, when we went there uh, a year ago to, to the Holy Land, you'll remember where this happened. You'll also remember the little game piece on the ground that's now covered with plexiglass where the Romans would have uh, gambled for Jesus' clothes. And this is where Jesus would go on trial before he was beaten and mocked uh, by the soldiers. But as Jesus awaits trial, there's trouble, trouble in the air. As we know, heaven and earth are colliding, good and evil. Jesus has a choice. And because it's the Passover season, which is important to note, uh, certainly they shouldn't be having trials during Passover and arresting people. They're trying to keep an eye on the thousands of Jewish pilgrims that come from all over Israel and the known world. Uh, Jesus probably arrested sometime on, uh, around midnight on Thursday. He had been taken to the high priest's house for a trial before the Sanhedrin. And he was uh, beaten by the temple guard. These religious leaders declared him guilty of blasphemy, which by Jewish law required a death sentence. And so their plan is unfolding as they would see it uh, as they tried to arrest and silence Jesus, if you will. God's plan is also coming to fruition. Let us never forget. So there's a hitch in this plan. They could condemn someone to death, but they couldn't carry it out. The Romans had taken the right away from them. So in order for Jesus to die, Pilate would have to agree to it. So early on Friday morning, 6 a.m., the Jewish leaders bring Jesus to Pilate. Uh, the, the governor would hear these cases and render verdicts. The record is clear. About that morning, Pilate asked these routine questions, as you find in the text. What is the charge against this man? And that's where I would lead you now to Matthew 27, verse 11 through 26, and Isaiah 53, verse 6 through 7. Matthew 27, 11 through 26, and Isaiah 53, 6 through 7. So early Friday morning, the Jewish leaders bring Jesus to Pilate. And he asked, what is the charge against this man? And the Jews were reluctant to answer directly because there was no Roman law against blasphemy. It was a Jewish matter. They couldn't say this man claims to be Messiah because Pilate wouldn't want to get dragged in some internal religious debate. So Pilate just asked, uh, and this is found in the four Gospels, are you the king of the Jews? That's what the Jewish leaders were saying. He said, right? To the Jews, it meant Messiah. But to Pilate, it would imply someone trying to mount an insurrection. Someone up to no good. They, they wanted Pilate to see Jesus as a threat to Rome. So Jesus' answer is a little ambiguous. He says, it is as you say. Meaning, yes, I am king, but not the kind of king you're referring to or would be thinking about. 
So now the choices become a little hard, I think, for Pilate and certainly uh, those who were onlookers. We think of John and Peter, others who loved Jesus and perhaps were listening in or standing by. So Pilate, this is the part of the scene where he washes his hands, you'll remember. Jesus is made to reply to the great amazement of the governor. Verse 14, Pilate has the power to kill him or grant Jesus his freedom. And he can't understand why Jesus doesn't speak up in his own defense. In regard to the gospel account uh, this week, another passage uh, comes to mind, right? As we explain Jesus' silence, as we try to understand it in Isaiah 53, which is written a few thousand years before, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he still did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his, her shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. Jesus is silent because he doesn't, he doesn't want to be left on the hook, off the hook. <laughs> He's ready and willing to lay down his life for our salvation. Isn't that amazing? And so here's where Pilate clearly wants no part in this. He's, he, he seems to be amazed but yet confused about who Jesus is and why the Jews want to kill him. And then he has this uh, idea, right, that might make everyone happy, as was custom of the day, to release a prisoner one prisoner at the Passover each year. So this could be a, a great opportunity to release Jesus so everyone would be happy. But as you know, Pilate wants to make the choice easy and obvious, so he names a notorious criminal after the people say, release, give us Barabbas, give us Barabbas. And so there's no way they were going to let Jesus uh, be released and so that goes sort of even against Pilate's own choice what do you want me to do with this prisoner who do you want me to release Barabbas or Jesus give us Barabbas we want Barabbas so maybe Pilate's wife tried to have some place in this maybe her words are echoing now in his mind but they make their decision Jesus, although is innocent, Pilate does seem a little troubled. He received this strange message, right, from his wife, and the people now are even asking for Barabbas, so he's going to upset people either way he makes this decision. Pilate asked the crowd the final question, what shall I do then with Jesus? Isn't that a question we all need to ask ourselves today? What shall I do with Jesus? What would you have done if you were Pilate? What would you have done if you were the Sanhedrin? What would you have done if you were in the Garden of Gethsemane that night? What would we do with Jesus? So if the crowd calls out for Jesus to be crucified, we remember this, and maybe Pilate's trying to preserve himself and his title, or perhaps he just wants to appease the people, make them all happy and move on. He sentences Jesus to death and releases Barabbas, the criminal. Uh, he was one who robbed and killed, according to Jewish and Roman law, had received already a death sentence. He was actually, I think, ready and willing to uh, live that out, but Jesus ends up taking his place. I think we miss that sometimes, too. Jesus is already paying a price or being substituted, if you will, for another person. But in all of that, Jesus remains the victor. He remains the curse for our sin. So here's a substitute. Here's a replacement. Barabbas walks away from prison. Jesus now being strung up on a cross between two other criminals later that day. What shall we do with Jesus? So is Jesus the son of God? Then the crowd give him over, right? Would we be like the Lord and say, uh, or be like the crowd and ask for Barabbas instead of Jesus? Would we ask Jesus to be the Savior, the Lord of our life? Would we give our heart to him? If he's a fraud, right, it makes sense to yell for him to crucify. If he's a liar, if he's a lunatic, they did the right thing. But if he is Lord, if he is the Messiah, then there's been a mistake. Friends of Jesus can't answer for us. Our grandma, my grandmother, grandfather can't answer for us. Our parents, our pastor, Sunday school teacher, we must answer the question for ourselves. 
just like our, our youth will very soon on their confirmation journey. We all are responsible individually, and I think also communally as a, a community of faith, we're responsible to be in mission and to do our point, our part, excuse me. So I asked the question again, what will we do with Jesus? What will you do with Jesus? What will Middlebury United Methodist Church do with this Jesus? There's no putting him off. There's no waiting for Easter to get excited about the truth and the, the uh, miracle of resurrection. But today, before all that, and even if it hasn't happened yet, hadn't happened yet, would you have listened, believed, and followed Jesus? If you've choose, chosen Jesus, excuse me, you know that he does not disappoint. Yes, life gets a little harder because you've said yes to something that runs opposed to the ways of the world. Uh, we do have a real enemy, Satan and his minions. There are evil influences, things that would enter our minds, hearts, souls that would keep us from being all that God had created us to be. We've learned this week, right? We can't just scrape the sin off and go on about business as usual. It's infected us. It is our human condition. So we fight a great, uh, more powerful, even if you will, infection, a virus that is causing people to die and not just once, but an eternal death. So we come against all that as well, uh, that condition. And, and we want to follow this way. We want to follow this person and the truth that he offers. And that will bring us life. It is bringing us life. We are working out our salvation with fear and trembling, but because of God and God's will, God's plan. So the truth is standing before you what will you do with this Jesus? What will we do with Jesus in this time, such a time as this? It's a tough question. But let us answer it truthfully each and every day. May God truly add his blessing to the reading and the study of this word. Uh, may it challenge you today. And may we all live into this truth that Jesus is real. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the life. Come back next week. Check in uh, periodically this week. We're going to add more uh, talks and videos. We want to stay connected, but for now, pray and just see what this word might have for you. God bless you, church. In the name of Jesus Christ, I love you. He loves you. Go in the peace of God the Father and the presence of the Holy Spirit. May it truly bless us all and bring us his peace. Amen.